Welcome to today's Authors at Google event. Today's speaker is Dave Hitz. And um, if you have questions later, I want to remind you to use the microphone so that um, our remote sites can hear the questions. So back to the introduction. No oh, problem. Oh. Ah, uh, yes, please turn off your cell phones. I was getting, uh, getting secret signals from the back. Dave's going to come look for his. <laughs> OK, so enough with the reminders. Uh, today's speaker is Dave Hitz. And I'm really delighted to introduce Dave. I've known Dave for uh, close to 25 years. Dave was an undergraduate at Princeton when I worked there. And I actually uh, lined Dave up with his first job in Silicon Valley. Uh, at the time, I got a phone call from, he was just about to finish up, and I got a phone call from my former boss, John Mashey, who at the time was working at MIPS Computer out here. And he uh, was calling me because another one of Dave's classmates had listed me as a reference. And I actually didn't really know that guy that well. And I said, but I didn't know you, you know, I didn't know that you were hiring new college grads. And if you're hiring new college grads, boy, do I have a new college grad for you. So uh, Dave went to work for MIPS. And then after that, he was at Auspex. I was still at Princeton. And I convinced uh, the faculty that we should buy their product. And we got, I think, the first production unit. It wasn't officially serial number one, but it was the first production unit. And when we unpacked it, it had a, uh, a handwritten note from Dave taped to the, to the side of the cabinet. Um, and then some more time passed, and Dave got the idea to start NetApp. And I was out here on business and uh, came and saw NetApp's first office over on Mission College Boulevard. They had a lot of uh, office space, and it was pretty empty and a few PCs kicking around. And Dave and I spent the rest of the day hiking through Yosemite and talking about filers. So with that, uh, that's sort of my capsule version of Dave's uh, work history. I'll let Dave take it from here and tell you more. Right. Dave. <laughs> that's for the first job ever. <laughs> um, this is the Google Author Talks, and so I suppose I should talk a little bit about my book, but that's mo mostly what I want to talk about. Mostly I have two topics that I'm interested in. The first is I went for a lot of years never having to be a manager, and after 13 years of never managing anybody, I ended up in charge of a couple hundred people, eventually almost a thousand people, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in budget. And I thought there's probably people at Google who are trying to figure out, would I like to do that transition? Would I never like to do that transition? Oh my god, I just agreed to do that. And, and so I'd like to talk some about that. I thought that would be relevant. And the other thing I'd like to talk about is the whole issue of culture and values. I guess the domain you'd call don't be evil here. And that might be a little bit of a sensitive area because for the past two years, Google's been number one on Fortune Magazine's Great Companies to Work For list. And this year, uh, Google was number four, knocked out of place by my company, NetApp. And so I've had an opportunity to have a whole lot of interviewers come and reporters going, so what do you think? Is Google doomed? How'd you guys knock them out? And, and so here's the answer that I've been giving. I, has anybody here watched the Miss America contest? This is kind of a guy-centric answer. But I've watched the Miss America contest, and I've noticed, uh, first of all, I've noticed whoever it is that wins that number one slot, she's usually pretty hot. Uh, but the other thing I've noticed is that whoever wins the number four slot also is usually pretty hot. And in fact, there's been years when I kind of thought number four was hotter than number one. And, and so what's my point here? My point is that I think when you're talking about which zone in the top 10, it's like, I know enough people here at Google to have zero concern that suddenly it might not be a, a great place to work or something. And in fact, I see a lot of interesting similarities in some of the values and culture and the way that we use them and the problems that we've had getting them established. So I'd like to talk about that as well. And let's see, was there anything else? Um, oh yeah, on the, uh, on the book piece. The number, uh, the title of my book is How to Castrate a Bull, and the answer is in this picture <laughs> of a knife. And in fact, if you look closely on, on the cover, you can see it's a dull knife. And on page 169, I'll explain why that's important. I won't do it here. <laughs> the, the book is really the story of NetApp. It started in 92. I was one of the co-founders, and so I've had 
not the unique opportunity, certainly others have done it, but the unusual opportunity to be there when it's three people writing notes on a placemat all the way through to IPO, hypergrowth, tech crash uh, for us, and kind of maturity, selling mostly to grown-up Fortune 1000 companies and becoming one of those. And it's just me trying to capture what that felt like, because a lot of people don't get to go through all those phases. And maybe you're at a company that's been through some of them already, and you're curious, what did it feel like? And I think there's a lot of, of similarity between Silicon Valley companies. Um, I know talking to people here, there's a lot of pieces. It's not the exact same story, but it's, it's similar. What's up with that title? Um, the reason for the title, How to Castrate a Bull, came because I worked on a cattle ranch for a couple of years. And if any of you have been in a, in a job interview and you've done all of this hard work on your resume and there's some person looking at the resume and they're pretending that they've already read it, but they haven't really and they're saying, so as I recall you went to Princeton University, yes. And, and they're kind of doing that thing. And before you worked at uh, IBM. And, and so, so I decided I'm going to put on the bottom of my resume other experience, castrating, herding, branding, <laughs> cattle. And I would see if they did, did they get to the bottom. I figured I would know. So there I am in an interview. And the woman's doing this thing. And she's like, so I see you. And she looks down. <laughs> and she looks up. And she says, management experience, I see. <laughs> so, so that's where I got the idea. But I never expected it to end up on the cover of the book. It was the code. The engineers give everything code names, right? So I'm writing a book. That's the code name. So I show up at a publisher, and this is the code name. And fortunately, I got a publisher with balls. And they looked at the title and said, whoa, people might remember that. <laughs> so that's where that came from. Um, one of my goals was not to write, like, I mean, in some ways it's a business book. How do you start it? How do we raise money? How do you grow it? What are the management tricks? But I really, really wanted a book that engineers could read since that was my background. And so a big part of what I thought of myself doing was taking businessy kind of stuff and translating it into engineering language. Like one of the best managers that I've ever worked with was our VP of sales for a long time. He d has no clue what an algorithm is. I mean, don't get him near a spreadsheet. But I started watching how he was managing. And when I reverse engineered what he was doing, I discovered he, he had a pretty regular algorithm. And so he never, ever would have described his job as, here's my management algorithm. But I've got in my book his management algorithm. I'll tell you in a bit. But so that's, that's kind of what I was trying to, to capture in a form that non-manager people might look and go, even if you never want to be a manager, that you might at least go, well, OK, that kind of makes sense what those guys are saying. I mean, it sounds stupid, but so how did I end up uh, in this transition to management? I graduated from college, 13 years. I was a programmer. I was a technical evangelist. I was an architect. Um, I said I never managed anybody, but that's not quite true. For about a month and a half, I had two direct reports. And I remember about three weeks in, one of the two was having a shouting fight with somebody in finance. And the point that he was shouting about was that it was completely idiotic that for expense reports, you should have to take your hotel bill and split it out into food and tax and do all of that by hand, because we didn't have spreadsheets. And why was finance such idiots? And she was shouting back in finance that she didn't make the laws, and he should talk to the IRS. And, Anyway, so it was my job to come and take the crinkled up sheet of paper that he'd stabbed a red pen through and uncrinkle it up and say to the finance woman, you know, next time you have this issue, why don't you come to me first? And so after that, I concluded I didn't want to be a manager anymore. And he concluded he didn't want me to be his manager anymore. And so that was my one brush with management in 13 years until my boss, who was the CEO of the company, said, I think you should run all of engineering because the woman who was my predecessor had said she was going to be there for four years, and she left after four years. So one of my first management lessons was why the CEO, Dan, thought that that idea made any sense at all. And it's an interesting lesson in how CEOs think to understand his point of view. What he said was, when I think about who I want as the VP of engineering of NetApp, I've got four requirements. Number one, I'd like them to know the culture. What's this company feel like? What kind of behaviors do we want? Number two, I'd like them to know the market. 
Who do we sell to? What do our products do? How do they use us? Number three, I'd like them to understand the technology. And number four, I wish they knew how to manage. And he said, you've got three out of four. <laughs> and odds are, I'm not going to find anybody else who's got better than three out of four. And so I would just assume that it's you, because I know you. And if I have to fire you, that's the way it is. But I like the odds. And I was like, but I have no clue how to manage. I've been like, and he said, no, 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 you're thinking about it wrong. You've been a technical evangelist. You've known what you thought we were trying to accomplish as a company. And you tried to convince people. And he said, here's the trick. When you're leading a group of hundreds of people, you can't tell them what to do. Because you've got like a staff of five people, and they've each got 50 or 100 people reporting to them. And they can't tell that many people what to do either. You've got to kind of convince them. Tell them where you're trying to get to, which is what you already do. Convince them that that's the place that would make sense to get to, which is kind of what you already do. And oh, by the way, they report to you, so you have to fill out some forms sometimes. So, so I mean, that, that, was the, that was the thing he convinced me. So there I am, all of a sudden, managing a couple of hundred people. And I did get a management coach. And, and the first lesson I learned, the very first one, was what I call management by whining. So here's the trick. Um, when you're not the VP of a bunch of people and you whine about stuff, nothing much happens. You know, you, I, I, you can try it. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but so all of a sudden, I had this staff of hundreds, and I would whine about stuff. And they, it was a great staff. The, the previous VP had set up a, a really good team. They'd run around and try and fix all the stuff I whined about. And so that led to the first revision of my management style, which was you had better whine accurately. <laughs> and so accurate whining became my new, how accurately can I whine? And so I went on like this for a while. And eventually, I had this epiphany late one night, which is, you know, whining is the evil twin of vision. And here's what I mean by that. Whining accurately is when you try to describe as perfectly as you can exactly the way the world is not, or that you wish it would not be. Whereas when vision is describing as accurately as you can how you wish the world would become. Right? So anytime you find yourself whining, you have an opportunity to flip your mood into, instead of describing all the stuff you don't like, try and describe the world in a way that wouldn't have those problems. Right? It's, it's a subtle difference, but what I can report is the emotional impact on the people you're talking to, when all you're doing is pointing out, I don't like this, I don't like that, I don't like that, that's not that motivating, let's say. But when you point at things and say, you know, if only this was this way, wouldn't that be better? It can be the exact same point you're making. But so I, I, kinda, I kinda tried to flip that. So let's see, I had some more lessons. Um, oh, here's a technique that I learned. We have a saying at NetApp, and the saying, it's, it's one of those, Silly little sayings that has a funny German truth in it. The saying is, what interests my boss fascinates me. <laughs> I don't know where it came from. Some guy said that, and it's like, wow, you know, that is true. What my boss says, oh, I found this interesting. And you suddenly go, well, let me study up on that. And so uh, one good management technique is to just go around, and when you spot something that you like happening that seems like a good thing, you go, wow, that's really interesting. Tell me more about that. And you do it in public, and pretty soon other people are like, well, that one got some attention, right? The trick of this technique is that you do have to be careful what you notice. There's a story I heard about George Lucas during the time that they were building um, a Skywalker Ranch, you know, his big studio thing. And supposedly, I don't know if this story is true, but it, it kind of rings true. He was walking along the ranch, you know, with his entourage, and they're building these buildings and painting them and stuff's going up. And he looks at this one building and he says, hmm, I kind of imagined it was going to be a darker shade of brown. And goes on, he doesn't care, whatever. Next day he comes back, it's been repainted a darker shade of brown. And he's pissed, I mean, that's expensive. And he goes, I didn't mean just because I said I thought it was going to be a darker shade of brown that you could repaint it a darker shade of brown. A lighter shade of brown would have been just fine too. God, you guys. Comes back the next day, it's a lighter shade of brown. <laughs> So, and there's actually, there's a corollary to this management technique. The corollary is, I was in a meeting, so I'm the VP of engineering, I've got my staff, and I mentioned something that interests my boss, the CEO, and oh, you know, I was talking to Dan, he thought that was interesting, and I love the response. One of the guys on my staff said, you know, what interests my boss's boss really clenches up my anus. <laughs> 
So again, you do this is a this is a technique to use delicately. Because it, it can you can you can get people going in the wrong place with it. Here's, here's the lesson I learned from Tom Mendoza, the one that I tried to turn into an algorithm. So Tom, Tom used to really piss me off. He, he was the VP of sales, and he would come around, and there'd be some problem in engineering that he had no clue at all about. And like, I'll just make up something stupid, but he'd, he'd be like, see that table over there? That, that table's on fire, right? I mean, it would be a, some technical thing. And you'd look at the table, and the table wasn't on fire. It's like, he's an idiot. Except, damned if two, two over, there wasn't a table that was smoking. And so he was always wrong, except he was always kind of right. Like, if you went and poked around at the thing that he said, every detail was wrong, and yet the gist of what he was saying was right. And the question is, how did he do that? And, and the answer is, he was very much taking a people-centric approach. He didn't understand the details. He didn't worry about the details. He would talk to a bunch of people about stuff, kind of add up the things they said, not understanding any of it, but just deciding, who do I trust? And it would kind of turn into an answer that was kind of, like if you were trying to figure it out by math, you'd never get there. But if you sort of added up the feelings of a whole bunch of people. And I found he was very valuable to go to for advice, even though he had no clue about what anything, anyone in engineering did. But what he would do is he would ask me all about the people who were working on the problem. Who's looking at it? Who's involved? What are they good at? How busy are they? Very people-centric. My background was engineering, and so I would always take a very problem-centric approach. How does this problem work? What are the pieces? I wonder what a right solution might be. I wonder, like I'd be taking notes. I'd start trying to solve the problem that the people who worked for me were supposed to solve. And when I reverse engineered Tom's algorithm for how he approached almost every management problem, here's what I found. Step one, who owns it? Whose job is it to do this? Because I'm the boss. It's not my job. It must be somebody else's job. Who, who is that person? If you can't find that person, that might be the problem. <laughs> right? So, OK, step one, who owns it? So you eventually you figure out who is the person who owns it. And then you ask question two, do I trust them? And trust is a funny word here, because I don't mean do I trust them like their heart's in the right place. I mean, that's part of it. But, but I also mean do I trust that they have the skill to do that? Like Tom, I mean, the guy that I'm talking about. I trust him so much, I would be willing to put my life on the line in situations where I thought that he had control of that. I, I trust him that way. And yet, I told you, I, if it was a spreadsheet, if it involved a mechanical device, you know, something complicated like a wristwatch, I don't trust him at all. Right, so you do you trust or not really is kind of in this, this domain. And then there's another part of it too of you might trust them and they might even have the right skill, but you just know they're busy. So like you trust them, like you know there's people like that, like I know they could do this, but realistically they're not gonna get to it because they got 20 other. So, so that's number one, who owns it? Number two, do I trust them? And then number three, if I can't find someone who owns it that I trust, find someone that, who can own it that I trust. And here's the genius of Tom, complete, idiot when it comes to technical stuff, and if he was here, he'd, he'd laugh when I said that, he took this algorithm and applied it recursively. So he had a problem. He couldn't find the owner. He couldn't find someone he trusted. So he needed to find that person. So how did he do that? He, he recursively went and said, who's the owner of the problem of finding the person? And so he went to the VP of HR and said, well, that would be a good owner. He trusted her. She then applied the problem recursively, which she said, how do I find a headhunter who can do this? Right? So eventually, we got to the root of the problem, was we found a headhunter who owned the problem, who we trusted. And, and, and then the recursion unwrapped. And I thought, oh my god, here's Tom Mendoza, the complete technical idiot, applying a management algorithm recursively. And so that was kind of what I felt like I was doing in reverse engineering what was going on. So I think that's enough management stuff, because I'm going to leave some Q&A time. I, I heard you guys will be all sparkly. Um, I'd like to switch for the, the culture and values piece. And I have to confess right up front, it took me a long time to even get comfortable to stand in front of a group of people and talk about corporate values. When our CEO, Dan, showed up, he showed up a couple years after we started, so a little bit uh, similar to here, you know, we had founders and eventually you need a grown-up to show up. And one of the first things Dan determined was that he believed we had a lot of backstabbing, a lot of, 
it, bad cultural dynamics, and he really wanted to change the nature of the company. And I'll tell you, the first thing that he attempted to try and make changes was a complete and utter failure. He called a meeting and he told people, what I think we should do is have a list of company values. And I remember in that meeting, one woman stood up. She was um, a tech pubs writer. Her name was Florence. And she asked a simple question. She said, how will these values be used against us? <laughs> and so she was the one who spoke up. Hang on a sec. She was the one who spoke up. But I have to say, a lot of us kind of had similar feelings. It just seemed so Dilbert. Like how, I mean, I personally, it rubbed me the wrong way. How, what does it even mean for a company to have values anyway? Aren't values something that people have? And why does my company want to tell me my values? I mean, what, am I going to supposed to vote for the right person next? Or what religion I'm supposed to? The whole thing. It just, I, I didn't like the feel of it. But pretty much nobody did. And in fact, Dan concluded it, that he was going to just shelve this project. So, so he set that aside. And the thing that's interesting is it reminds me so much of the story of poking around the web, trying to figure out where did this don't be evil thing come from. And as near as I can tell, Paul, I'm going to get the name wrong, Buckheim and, uh, and Amit uh, Patel were in one of these meetings. And up on the board is going, you know, show up to meetings on time and be a good corporate citizen and trust each other and all of this stuff. And they just were like feeling like just like we were. But instead of asking how will these values be used against me, one of the two of them instead said, well, why don't we just say don't be evil? Why wouldn't that capture it? And it sort of worked its way up over the next few weeks to the top of the list. And I really like that, because all that other stuff sounds so mumbo jumbo. And Don't Be Evil captures things in a different way. I wondered if somebody had had the idea of saying that when Dan was there, instead of asking how will these be used against us. Uh, maybe we would have gotten the list, because we've got the list now too, right? And you guys have that one, and then underneath it there's a list, right? <laughs> so um, Whether it would have been a lot quicker. But here's what Dan did instead. The second thing Dan tried after that first thing flamed out worked much better. The very first uh, strategy offsite that he had, so you get your senior team and you take them offsite and you're all in a meeting for a couple of days. And at the end of the meeting, Dan said, I'm just going to go around the room and I'm going to ask a simple question. I want everybody to tell me, how would you rank the candor in this meeting? So you guys know each other better than I did. Did you say the same thing in the meeting that you're saying out in the halls or when you're in the bathroom or something? Um, did, do you believe the stuff that came out of your own mouth or that came out of the other guy's mouth? I mean, and so he said, scale of one to five, five is good, one is bad, just go around the room. He said, I'm not going to beat you up, I just need to know. So we ran around the room and the average score was like two. <laughs> and which was kind of, like I said, Dan's instinct coming in was that it was not the, the healthiest environment. And he lived up to his word, he didn't beat us up, he just said, well, this is important to me. I see we have some work to do. And he's asked that same question at most of, not like every little meeting, but you know, the, the big ones. And something about just knowing, yeah, this matters. That technique worked a lot better than this values thing. But eventually, as I got to know Dan better, I came to understand why did he have this bug up his butt about values? And I'll tell you, the reason was the previous company where he worked was shot through with fraud. He was hired as the COO, the chief operating officer, and they had this weird pattern with some of their big customers. They weren't paying their bills, or the, the average time to bill payment was very high. And he started digging in, and it was weirder than that. They would pay some bills right on time, and others they would never pay. So he, one large customer in particular, he went out, he had the big pile of purchase orders, and he goes out. He's the COO, he's talking to the CFO, the chief finance officer at this other company, and they're going through. And Dan says, well, here's one you didn't pay. And the CFO kind of looks at it and says, you know, that's not my signature. The company, Dan's company, is, the name was NET, Network Equipment Technology. The sales staff was forging POs from customers and sending them equipment they didn't order. They also had secret warehouses, so they were inventing fake customers and sending equipment that fake customers didn't order to the warehouses that did, didn't exist. So. Dan was the, the COO, had been there not that long, six or nine months, I don't know the exact timing. By the time they got to the bottom of this, the CEO was fired, the VP of Worldwide Sales was fired, the CFO 
of their company was fired. There was an SEC investigation. There was a shareholder lawsuit. The stock went from 35 to 6. And maybe the worst thing was all of this stuff was generating fake profits that didn't really exist. And so they'd been hiring on the basis of that. So they laid off a third of the workforce. So when Dan said values, what he actually meant was, I don't want to go there again. And I have to say, you know, I kind of shared his opinion. <laughs> and, and so we, we kind of approached the values thing a second time. And you knew you could say, well, let's make this really big list, like don't lie on purchase orders or don't write. And you know, you could get a really, really long list of stuff. But at some point, you kind of want to synthesize it up a little bit. I mean, you could crunch it all the way up to the very top of like, don't be evil, right? But you, you still, I often think, I'm, personally, I'm not a religious person. I'm an atheist. But I think there's a lot of interesting lessons in religion about how you communicate and talk about morality. And so if you look at Christianity, it happens to be one I know better. But you've got this top simple rule, like do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's kind of don't be evil, right? And then there's the second one, which is, well, here's some particular tips. So we've got these 10 tips for healthy living. You know, if you want a little bit more. And then, and I, you know, I poked around your guys' website. It's similar to ours in the inside. So then you've got these 10 healthy tips. And then you click on each of those. And it's like, well, here's the longer version. Go read the Gospels, right? I mean, it's sort of, and if you really, really want the long stuff, then you can go hang out with Sergi, right? And get the chief philosophy officer, whatever you call him, um, version of it. So, so we eventually did come up with our list. One of the things that bothered me about our list was that it, in some ways it felt like other people's list. You know, trust each other, uh, integrity with customers. And I was thinking, that's just kind of dull, boring. But then I made an analogy with the constitution of a country. Like, supposing you're starting a new country, and you're writing your constitution, right? You're trying to figure out what should be in it. And I'm just picturing these founding fathers, mothers, and they're in there talking. And one of them says, well, how about freedom of speech? And then one of the other ones says, yeah, no, that one's taken. <laughs> That's not, I mean, of course they look similar. There's going to be some differences. Um, a, a difference, we've made the choice. We don't like prima donnas. Some companies say, hey, they're great. In fact, I got in a discussion with a customer about that. This customer said, I love prima donnas. They're the smart ones. Yeah, they piss everyone off around, but they get 10 times more done. Our approach has been we'd rather have people that can work in a team environment. That's, that's a choice. That's, that's not. Um, but so what's my point? So you build these values. And so we did that. And here's an experience that taught me a lot about how the values can actually be used. We were in a meeting having a discussion, and the topic was, should we lie to a customer? And which is, you know. <laughs> and, and actually, to make it more idiotic still, the customer in question that we were considering whether or not to lie to was the NSA. <laughs> so like, who was probably listening, you know? And so, we're, so here was the context of the discussion. The NSA had a feature that they wanted that we didn't have. And our competitor, which was in fact Auspex, that Pat mentioned, also did not have the feature. And the NSA said, we will buy from whoever can give us this feature within a year. We'll buy right now. You, you convince us you'll give us the feature. We didn't believe we could do the feature in less than 18 months. And we had actually worked prior at Auspex. We were pretty sure they couldn't do it in less than two years. But they were promising a year. And we told them 18 months. And they said, you know, you're going to lose. And, and so the question, and we said, you know, we don't think they can do it in 18 months. And they said, why don't you worry about you, and we'll let them worry about them. So the idea that we had was, now, if they choose us, they'll get it in 18 months. If they choose the other guy, they won't get it for two years. So we would actually be helping the customer, right, if we would lie to them. So I guess part of my message is when you're trying to figure out why it is that lying to somebody actually is in their best interest, that's not. But so here's how this played out. We had already done this values exercise, and one of the employees, not like a boss type, one of these employees who wasn't part of it even, but just you know, had been through, we talk about it, you know, have the meeting, look, here's the list. He said, so we did all this work on the values, and we've got this thing of integrity that includes like, don't lie to customers. Isn't that what that means? And he raised this value. And so I'm not that proud that I was in that meeting, or that I was not the person who said this. But the thing that I am proud of is that once he raised it in that context, it shut down the discussion. We just stopped. 
and we told the customer the truth and we lost the business. And it reminded me, when, again, you know, I was going to come here and, and talk to you guys, and so I was poking around the web, and Eric Schmidt had a comment about the don't be evil thing, and he said, perhaps the best thing about that, because it doesn't say what you should do or shouldn't do, it's kind of vague, don't be evil, but it gives you permission to ask the question, are the orders I'm getting okay to follow or not? It gives you permission. And, I, and I, that, to me, the question that Florence had asked, how will these values be used against us? I thought this experience really got to the heart of that. I don't think values are that useful to use against employees. I think they're much more useful for employees to use against managers. And here's the reason I think that. So how many managers in here? So you managers, it's awesome, right? You have so many tools to beat the crap out of employees. <laughs> you can fire them. You can give them bad raises. You can assign them to bad work for 80% of their time. You can, <laughs> like, the, you have all of these tools at your disposal. It's not like you really need one more. But employees don't have all that many tools against their management. And as a manager, one of the best possible tools that you can give your employees is to say, here's some things that I actually believe that are like good things, you know, values. Maybe you don't believe all a company's values or maybe some more than others, but talk about the stuff that's especially important to you. So here's some stuff I believe. And if you catch me screwing up, please help me. If you take that approach to it, then I think you, you end up in a whole different place. So let's see, I had a bunch of ideas here that... Um, oh, yeah. One of the things that I believe about values, I said I'm not a particularly religious person. I actually think when you look into game theory, and there's a book I read called Zero Th Sum that talks about how do you go build models of cooperation that allow more to get done. I think when you look at game theory, a lot of values are actually just things that are a good idea in the long run. And again, let me just use the Ten Commandments as, a, as an example. If you would like to live in the same neighborhood with the same people for the next 10 years and have a good experience doing that, I have some tips. Number one, don't kill them. <laughs> Number two, don't sleep with their husband or wife. Number three, don't take their stuff. Right, just safety tips from Dave. You heard it here first about how to live in the same neighborhood for a long time. When you apply that stuff to your business, you get a very similar outcome. If your goal is to make the most money this quarter, absolutely right now, I recommend you lie to your customers. If you're, that might work for one quarter. If your goal is to still be in business for 10 years, and you hope still to be selling stuff kind of like, you know, the new version, but kind of like what you're selling now, but the new version to the same people, in 10 years, I recommend you don't lie to them about what you're going to do. So let me finish up this story with Auspex and the NSA. They didn't deliver the feature in 12 months. They didn't deliver it in 18 months. And I found out later, years later, from one of the people who had been there at the time, the feature they promised, they never started. And the customer eventually figured this out and fired them, you know, as a, as a vendor. And we got that business, and we've had a very strong partnership now with the NSA for 10 years. And so I really do believe this thing about the long-term, you know, the, sort of the game theory approach. If you're just doing it for the one shot, maybe this stuff doesn't matter. But if you really do take it out over a longer period, then I think it starts to make a lot more sense. So that is my conclusion on values. You know, it's interesting. Again, I was poking around Google just looking at stuff. At the point of the IPO, Larry and Sergi and, um, and Eric, all of them apparently made some kind of a blood pact. I don't know if they actually poked the knife in their finger, you know, and, and did that thing. But, but they all agreed, we're going to stay here for 20 years. And, I, you know, who knows if, if they really were. But to me, that is the foundation of a culture where you would expect the kind of behavior that we don't want to do a bunch of stuff right now that'll tank us two quarters out. I mean, isn't that kind of where we got in trouble with Wall Street? And when you just sort of look, what were they thinking? How, or Madoff, you know, you know the, the Ponzi guy? Like, how, did, what, how was exactly was he imagining this thing would play out? He, he couldn't, so to me, when you just sort of extend it out and say, my goal is still to be kind of doing 
in this business or the company being in this business five years out, 10 years out, a whole bunch of stuff that you would have thought made sense. Suddenly it's like, never mind values, never mind morality. That's just like, that, that, that's not going to work out well for me. That's where I think this stuff ends up aligning. So what I'd like to close with is I'd, I'd like to close with a discussion of magic. And what I mean by magic, I mean this in a corporate sense. What I mean by magic is, you know how there's sometimes you've got a group of 10 people and they're working on some projects and amazing stuff just happens, like way more stuff than 10 people ever ought to be able to get done. And you have another group, and then this group's working hard, they're coming in, but you have another group that's also working hard. They seem to be like doing lots of stuff. It's not like they're slacking off, but somehow their stuff never quite goes there. And what's the difference? And the more time I spent being a manager instead of an engineer, the more I started believing that this group had magic. And that really bothered me because the engineer in me was like, look, how does this really work? Pragmatic, what is the scientific principle? This makes no sense. And eventually, I actually figured it out. And the key was Arthur C. Clarke. Arthur C. Clarke has a saying which he says, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So you show up on a desert island and there's people there that have no technology at all and you show them your flashlight and like, wow, that's magic. And so my conclusion was, the human brain from where we stand today is a sufficiently advanced technology. We have no clue how it works. And so the ways that you go about motivating people are magic. And, and magical metaphors, and you know, when people talk about building a good culture, we want to construct the right environment, I think that's completely the wrong metaphor, because it's like, oh yeah, we'll put this bolt here and this bolt here. You're much better off thinking about it in the context of organic analogies or magic analogies. Organic, we'll plant the seed, we'll nurture the seed, we'll hope for the right weather. If we see something wrong, maybe we'll water it. Oh look, there's a weed, we'll, we'll pull it. But you don't, you get, get away from the control and the mechanical and the, the, the dominate metaphors and get more into the nurture. And when it came time for us to fire our first CEO, that was obviously a very stressful period for the company. And the other founders, except for him, he was one of the founders, went to the board of directors and said, you should fire this guy. And they said they would, but then they kept not doing it. It was like a year after every board meeting, we'd call him up, did you? Oh yeah, we said we would, but we didn't. It was a tense time at the office. Because uh, we were doing this, the boss knew this. So I remember being in a conference room with the CEO at the time, and he was like, why don't you think I'm the right guy? I have done this before. And I was, at that time, I was uh, four years out of college. I'd, I'd worked for two years at the job Pat got me and two more years at Auspex. And here's the answer I gave him. Four years out of college, never managed anybody. I said, boss, I think that really good CEOs have a bag of pixie dust that they can sprinkle on problems to help make them go away. And I don't think you have any pixie dust. And naturally, that just pissed the hell out of him. <laughs> but I'll tell you, I absolutely believe, after 15 more years of experience in the industry, that some people really do have magic pixie dust. And just to kind of help you understand what I'm talking about, most of you, I bet, can think to a time where someone in your life, a teacher when you were younger, or a professor, or a manager, maybe a parent or an uncle, did something. You can't really explain what it was, but they got you to go a place you didn't think you could do. Whatever the thing was they did, right? They encouraged you. They told you they thought that you could. They trusted you. They loved you. They did something, and it worked. And so that's what I mean by magic. So I think if you can tie that in to a work environment, most people, I think, want to do something that, that, that they feel good about. In fact, when you look at the research behind the, the great place to work, the, the best companies to work for, what they concluded was all the stuff, you know, people talk about, oh, look, we've got great lunches and you know, Grateful Dead and that stuff. That, that stuff's great, right? There's absolutely nothing wrong with any of that. But what the research showed was that's not the stuff that in the end really matters. They came up with three things. Number one, do you like the people you work with? Do you show up and you feel like, these are friends? I, I mean, maybe they're not your most best friends, but I mean, I, I like them. I enjoy spending time with these people. If you do, 
then you're more likely to see a group of people at whatever the lunch place is enjoying their time together, right? Because they like each other. So number one, do you like the people you work with? Number two, are you proud of the work you do? Like you would tell your mom or your daughter or your friend or, you know, this is, this is what I do. I, I feel good about it. Don't, don't be evil. Um, and number three, do you trust the management of your company? And it's interesting. It doesn't say like them. It's trust them. Trust them that they're not lining their own pockets. Trust them that they're guiding the company in a place that makes sense for the long term. Trust them that, that they're being fair. And if you get those three things, those things matter more. So, so let's see. Let me just close, and then I'll do some q and I want to close with a little bit more about the book. When I started, I had a couple of goals of who I thought the target audience was. I mentioned engineers, of course. I, I was an engineer. I wanted to write a book that people wouldn't look and go, oh my god, that management drivel. I, I wanted to get something that would sort of put it in a, in a context. Uh, and the other thing, though, is that I thought it would be a businessy book. You know, if somebody was doing a startup, this talks about startups, or if you're in hyper growth, or if you're a, a larger. As I started writing it, I encountered a problem. And the problem was, because the time span was so long, even if I assume a, a savvy business person who'd worked in Fortune 1000 company marketing departments their whole career, they might not know anything about Silicon Valley startups. They might not know what an angel investor is. They might not know how VCs work. They might, so I couldn't just dive in with that jargon. I, even things like angel investor, I just had to define. It's a businessy thing, but that mature company style person might not understand it. So I wanted, I, I mean, I assume my audience was smart people, well, but, but not necessarily experienced in all startup, mid-sized, giant company stages. And likewise, the Silicon Valley startup person might be a really good business person, but have no clue about deployment of global operations in 100 countries and internationalization and legal laws and all of that stuff. And so I ended up with a book that a lot of that stuff was stripped out. And something interesting happened. When I was doing the, the beta testing, the early reading on my book with people, one of my early readers said, my son's in high school trying to figure out whether to go get a business degree or not. So I gave him, I hope it's OK, I gave him the rough draft of your book. And, uh, and he thought it was cool. He hadn't really understood what business was like. And, and another I, a, a woman that I gave it to, she said, my mom's always said, I have no clue what you do. You work in Silicon Valley. You go sit in your cube. What does that mean? And so she gave her my book. And that led me to a whole new round of beta testing with my book. It, when you think of writing a book, it's a lot like an engineering project. I do code names, everything, release schedules. And, uh, and so my mom had a, a uh, reading group that she'd been in since I was five. I'm 46, so since, you know, 41 years. And most of these women were not business women. A couple of, one of them worked as, uh, as an executive in a finance company, but most of one was a nurse. A number of them were housewives. So I gave them the book, and I got really interesting feedback, like, what's a CEO? And that led me to a whole different zone. Like, you, I, I couldn't do that, right? <laughs> I had, I, it really was targeted at people that kind of had been in the business world. So I, I put in a glossary. But one of the things that's been fun to me about this is just as a result of the, the span of it's got to be OK for engineers, and for business people, it's got to be OK for people who are in either small, medium, or large companies, that ended up opening it up as a, a much broader sky, style of discussion than I'd expected. So that was very rewarding to me to start to realize that, that that could work. And I would like to thank you all for spending your time here. And I'll open it up to Q&A. It always takes one. Uh, you just go up to the microphone. Yeah. So uh, and of course, in true fashion, I'll talk about something you haven't talked about at all. So my question is. Isn't that the best? Yeah. When, when NetApp you know, came into being, Sun was already around, SG, SGI was always around. How did you convince customers that you were better than a Sun with this and, you know, and a, a memory card or an uh, internet? <coughs> okay. uh, that is a great question. And my favorite book on the subject is The Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton Christensen. And in summary, his answer is, don't try to do something that a bunch of other people do and just do it better. Try and do something they're not even doing. And the example that he gives that I think is great, the, the transition from the, transistor, from the tube to the transistor for high-end stereos. So the tube had been used forever. It's this big thing, glows, hums, starts up slow, blows out, 
and they invented the transistor, and everybody's trying to figure out how can we use transistors to go build high-end stereos? And the answer was, don't do that. Right? It was, it, they weren't high enough quality, the sound was tinny, it was sucky. But here's something that somebody noticed, uh, I think it was some of the Japanese companies, those transistors are cheap, they're light, and they use low power. And so if you would like a cheap, light, low power radio, you can make it with transistors. And so instead of doing the same thing that everybody else was doing but better, making living room stereo sets, they invented the transistor radio for teenagers who had no living room. No, and not enough money to buy a living room stereo set. And so they invented a really low and bad sound quality lightweight, which happened to be within my budget as a teenager, better than nothing and cheap enough that I can afford. And over time, that product improved to a, a different space. So we were not competing against high-end sun systems. I remember visiting one of our very first customers. This person had an outdated sun workstation, whatever the previous generation was from the one on his desk. He had it on a big cardboard box, and he had SCSI cables stringing out with like stacks of these things coming up, and then he had manuals sitting on top, and you know, if it tipped over, his whole data was doomed. That's who we sold to, to start with. And then over time, it moved up. And that's really Christensen's point. Christensen's real lesson is technology on average improves faster than customer requirements go up. And so think about that in the context of like mainframes versus PCs. PCs were nowhere near as good as mainframes and yet a lot of what we used to do with mainframes we do with PCs now. And over once upon a time on people's PCs there was not enough disk space. Remember that? Your disks were always full. It's like, oh my god. And the other thing, you know, and partly this is generational. Some people haven't lived in this era, but there was a period where every time Intel came out with the new chip, everybody was running around going, oh, I got the 50 megahertz clock doubled. You've still only got the 25 megahertz clock doubled than mine. And like, people cared. And Christensen's argument is the technology gets so much better eventually that you get, he calls it a goodness oversupply where the customers don't even care anymore about that thing. So here's what would happen if someone came to try and sell me a faster PC. My response would be, the PC I have, I mean, it's different if you're doing programming work. Mostly now I do PowerPoint and spreadsheets and that stuff. But you know, they try and sell me a faster PC. My response would be, well, I don't know. Could the battery last longer instead? How about it was lighter? How about when it sat on my lap, it wasn't so hot? Right? I, I, the speed. And so, so we started as this low-end work group thing and sort of moved up into higher-end engineering and eventually ended up competing head-to-head -head against folks like EMC for enterprise data center class stuff. But we never started out going, oh yeah, well, we're going we're gonna to take on the big iron guys. That's, it, it was a whole different thing. It, it's an awesome book, The Innovator's Dilemma. I, it explained, you know, I, I think every company becomes vulnerable to it. If I was Google, the question I'd be asking is, when is the search good enough? You know, so we add all of this more stuff. At what point do you just say, you know what, the PC's fast enough. How about lighter? And so you, you get some different value props, maybe. I'm not saying you're close to that. I'm just saying that's always the, the end game, whether it's two years from now or 10 years from now, that tends to be where stuff gets to. Thank you. Is that a long enough answer to a short enough question? That I scare, there was someone over here who I, I think he just had to leave after I <laughs> wouldn't stop talking. So you talked about company life cycles, and I think NetApp's like, what, 15 years old or about? We started in 92. OK. So 17, yeah, see, see, see. or whatever. See, you can still <laughs> do math. Um, Google's about you know, 10 years old. Uh -huh. One of the things that I'm noticing is um, not a lot of these startup Silicon Valley companies last beyond their first or maybe second CEO. You know, there's that one defining you know, Scott McNeely at Sun and people like that. Mm -hmm. I guess I was curious, especially in light of the rumors now about you IBM You better hope Sun. he doesn't leave, right? Yeah. <laughs> so my question is, you know, both for NetApp and just the Silicon Valley in general, do you see these companies lasting, you know, 100 years long or 50 years long? Or do you sort of see, it looks like a lot of them are kind of hitting that wall. And I was curious what you thought would get through that wall and um, what NetApp's challenges are in that area too. Um, so I think there's two different issues. The, the question of company longevity. Um, one, of the, one set of issues is kind of more internal. And do you structure your company around a cult of personality? I, I, I read a fair bit of business stuff because I worry about this stuff. There's a book called Built to Last, and it argues that there's a myth that it's healthy to have these charismatic, bold CEOs, the Scott McNeelys and the Larry Ellisons. You know the joke about Larry Ellison? What's the difference between Larry Ellison and God? 
God does not think he's Larry Ellison. <laughs> and so there's this myth that having these, these CEOs like that is good for a company. And they argue the opposite. They say, you know, it's not like you exactly want a dull, boring CEO, but you'd like somebody who they don't try to make the whole company be about them. Maybe they try and make it more be about other people. And it would be OK if there were other people who could do stuff too. And even the idea of succession and it's OK for someone else to come up, um, if that's an OK thing, I think over time, I mean, these are long-term skills for companies to learn. But there's companies that are pretty good at it. I mean, Intel has done a pretty good job of grooming the next guy, getting the next guy in place. That person knows they don't get to stay forever. It, it, it's a skill that a company can have. So there's these internal skills that I think can foster the, I'm running this company till I die. I, I think that company's likely to have trouble when it gets to there versus a I'd be willing to share power kind of a model. That's internal. The other question is external. And the external question really has to do with what are the market dynamics? What are the forces? Is there still a space there for a company to be separate? And that's complicated. I, I struggle to understand that. I, I look, for instance, at, at what IBM did recently with Lenovo, where you know they've been building laptops and PCs. They invented the PC. And then they said, you know what? The ThinkPad, it's a great PC, but it's not really our business. We'll spin it out. And like, why? Like for a long time, it wasn't a separate company. And then it is. Well, I mean, it went to Lenovo, which but was a much smaller company than IBM. So I don't, I don't know. It's, there's these sort of forces of what stuff should fit together and, and what stuff should be separate. Uh, Sun, somebody mentioned, is an interesting example because when I look at like all the different companies, I look at two styles. I, I built an ecosystem of the companies around NetApp, just sort of trying to understand who are the people that we compete with. We sell equipment that goes into big data centers. So the folks, maybe we compete, maybe we partner, maybe they're just kind of there. Like we don't compete that much with Juniper, for instance, but the people have networks. And I built this ecosystem and I noticed a pattern. And the pattern ones, there's companies that really focus on building IP. So they, you know, NetApp, Juniper, Cisco, Oracle, Microsoft, uh, EMC kind of mid-size. Their, their whole DNA is about building IP. There's other companies that are mostly about work with customers and understand their issues and sell them stuff, kind of aggregate customers. And that's people like Arrow and Avnet and CDW. You know, if you buy your own stuff, go to CDW.com, the computer warehouse guys. And they're, they're really, they don't invent anything. They just kind of sell all these other people's stuff, put it together. Here's the interesting thing. IBM and HP, although they have enormous amounts of IP, really, in some ways, focus much more on the customer piece than on the IP. And the reason I say that is because they're very willing as companies to say, eh, disk drive's not so interesting, we'll sell that. Oh, that's starting to get more interesting. We've been reselling it for five years, but we'll buy it. It's like it's a business ROI thing. Whereas it's hard to imagine Microsoft being happy about somebody else's IP is going out. For, that's not their DNA, right? They want to own it all. Which, it's fine. It's just two different strategies. Here's the interesting thing. Sun looks so much like HP and IBM. You know, they, it'll do, they can build you a whole data center. They've got all this stuff, and yet it's a tenth the size. And it's very IP-centric company. So I think it's, it's kind of in an odd between, I'm not sure they get to stay separate, right? I mean that, because I, I'm not sure that their size justifies the business style they've been shooting for. But I don't know, that is a, you asked a really subtle question. Does somebody should do like a PhD on it or something? <laughs> uh, so a lot of business books assume that the, reader, the readers um, basically have good judgment and given the information will make uh, you know, a good decision, but that's not always the case. You know, people can make harmful decisions, and you know, by definition, half of us are in the bottom half of decision makers. So, <laughs> should you? So, should um, we? So, with that knowledge, should that affect, in your opinion, should that affect people's decision making processes, or should that be something that's ignored? Or? There, there's actually predictably irrational is a book that just came out on exactly the topic of why is it that people so repeatedly and predictably make stupid decisions that appear to be the wrong um, decision. First of all, let me talk a little bit about um, business books, because you made some assumptions like they might be designed to be the best to help people. Selling business books is a business. I hired a, a co-writer, and he's been an editor for 15 years. He's written books before, and when we started designing this book, very engineering metaphor, 
trying to figure out like who's the target audience, what's the demographic, how would we sell it, how it work. And one of the things he said was, <coughs> well, for business books, there's two kinds. There's the deep academic tome that you spend weeks reading, and then there's the book, which is good stuff, but you read it on a cross-country plane flight. And so you need to be able to buy it at the airport bookstore, and on a cross-country plane flight, you need to be able to read it, including the time for the meal. And I'm like, so it is, he sounds like, like a product marketing requirements person, right? Um, and, and I said, well, oh my god, well, what does that actually mean? And he said, oh, 50 to 60,000 words. <laughs> right? I mean, he just knew. So we spec'd out this book, and you, um, so, and then you're trying to figure out, so I mean, don't get too much about these things are like entirely for your good. I'm selling this thing to make money. Actually, for me, I'm selling it, the money's going to the NetApp Charitable Fund, because I don't need the money, but, but you get the idea, right? It's, it's a business. But the, the piece about the ir irrational decisions, the predictably irrational, is very interesting to me. There's this whole branch of economics, and the focus of it is, why do people keep making decisions that are stupid? And a lot of the assumptions of the economists who think that the decisions people are making are stupid, I think their assumptions are wrong. And let me just give you an example. They love to do experiments like this. Here's the experiment. I come up to you and I say, I will give you a $100 bill right now. Here it is. Or, if you come back in two weeks, I'll give you 200. Now here's the way the economists think. The economists look at that and they say, that is a return on investment of 1,527%. No idiot would, would ever take the 100 and turn down the 200, right? And so they go, everybody's an idiot, predictably irrational, they're all stupid. And I look at that and I say, so I meet some guy in the street and he promises me 100 now, I see the bill, or 200 if I can hunt him down in a week. What are the odds I can find him in a week? I think I'll take the 100 now, right? And so I think a lot of, uh, the black swan had another example of this, which I think is good. The, the, the black swan example was Professor John and Fat Tony. And Professor John knows mathematics and knows that a coin toss every time is 50% fair coin. And even if the coin is run multiple times in a row, what are the odds of the next toss being 50-50? It's 50-50. And so Fat John and Professor Tony see this coin, and it gets tossed 50 times in a row. And the guy tossing it says, I swear to you, this is a fair coin. And it's scientifically inspected. And it is a fair coin. And it goes heads 50 times in a row. And so here's the question, what's the next toss going to be? And Professor John says, it's 50-50. And Fat Tony says, they said I was a straight coin, but I'm telling you, that coin's crooked. It's definitely coming up heads. And I'll tell you what, I think that it's Fat John that's right, and not Professor Tony. So, so how did we get on here? Uh, decision making. The, the trick with decision making, it's really, really hard to know when the spreadsheet might be right and when Tom Mendoza pointing at smoking tables and listening to people telling him stuff might be right. right? The, it, it, it's really subtle stuff. I, I think the best way to learn it is one, do a bit of it, and two, hang out with people or read books and just kind of absorb it. Because there, it, there's not, remember, there's no mechanical list, it's organic, it's not construction, there's not a simple set of rules. Think nurture, think practice, think, it's, it's, it's that domain of stuff. So I, I, there is no simple answer. I don't know the rules here. Do we just keep going till we run out of tape? Or I'm fine. All right, I've got two questions, so you can choose which one you want to answer. Um, can you learn to have pixie dust? And the other one is, what's the typical errors that engineers that become managers do that they really should avoid? Um, can you learn to have pixie dust? I think you can. There's. Uh, there's been some research on what are the different skills that leaders need to have. And there's a bunch of them that a, that a leader ought to have. Um, they ought to be able to do certain kinds of management. They ought to be able to give people proactive feedback, right? I mean, you guys must see these lists. But the interesting thing about the research was it's a little bit like the research about a great place to work. There's all these things that would be nice. It'd be nice to have a really good cafeteria. It'd be nice to have a gym. It'd be nice to have childcare. There's this big list of stuff that would be nice to have. But you kind of get down to it. When you look at the management list, it turns out, I, this is something I, I personally learned, you can be shitty in a whole bunch of different dimensions. But if your employees trust that your heart's in the right place, they will cut you so much slack. And it, one thing that I see that's interesting is if you're willing to share credit, 
people will cut you so much slack. It, managers that I see fighting for, look what I did, look what I, you know, never mind my team, here's, and, and they try and get the credit. Somehow it's like it drains energy out of that team. The managers who anytime credit, anytime praise comes their direction, they pass it on. It's like it builds in a healthy way, and then you get more of the, it's not less, it's more, like the ones that grab it themselves. So my wife and I went and saw um, oh, Carly Fiorini, and she gave a, a speech, it was a good, she's a good speaker, and I enjoyed it. At the end of it, though, my wife made an interesting comment. She said, you know, she never made anyone else look good. The whole thing was about all the great stuff she did. And I, I just thought that was really interesting. Right? I mean, even in my talk today, something I've tried to be conscious of is Dan did some really, uh, yeah, I started the company, me and James and, and this other guy we fired named Mike, who was an awesome guy. You know, we went and started another company after ours and it went public too. Like, lightning doesn't strike twice, right? Genius guy. Um, but I, I tried to make Tom look smart. I said he's bad at technology, but I mean, he's a lot smart. And, and I just, I thought about that. I think that's a, a big part of the, the magic to do that. What was the second question? Oh, the, the mistakes that, that new engineering managers make. I think the, the little lesson that I told of Tom, that for me was a big one. I think a lot of engineers are so used to problem solving themselves because that's what they've spent their whole time doing that they don't think about problem solving. It's still problem solving, but it's problem solving in the context of people. When, when uh, I replaced the predecessor VP to me when I was running engineering, which I did for six years and then stopped, but she commented that she still viewed herself as doing engineering, it's just that the components that she was working with were people. And she wasn't plugging them into circuit boards, she was plugging them into organizational structures and rules about how they, they work together. And my perspective on that was, wow, I still get to be a programmer, it's just that now my CPUs are people's brains and my programming language is PowerPoint. This is awesome, <laughs> right? And, and once you kind of crack through that mental model, the, the key, you still get to be a problem solver, right? you still get to apply all of your engineering things, but don't work on the problem itself, work on the people working on the problem and working on how they communicate and work on the magic parts, right? The nurture them and water them and pick the weeds and, and that stuff. But, it, but actually the engineering skills are still pretty valuable in that context of like organize, Uh, so a bit of a uh, kind of a soft question. Um, so you started in background in engineering, and then you move on to doing management and that sort of thing. It's a big jump, and as you said, there's there's ways you can approach it. But overall, do you think it was a good decision? Um, it was a good decision for me personally, but I have to say I, I think that is a very personal thing. Um, I I like to always be doing different things. I have a short attention span. And, and it's, lots of people have short attention spans and there's different styles. Like you could have a short attention span saying, I wanna be working on a new project, but it's okay if it's still Ajax. Or you could have a different type of short attention span, which is I'd like to be doing something really pretty different. And I tend to have the short attention span type where I'd like to be doing something more different. So I did a lot of programming and then I did a lot of talking to early customers. I mean, not like, the technical evangelism, here's how it works, here's why it makes sense. And then I did more back architecture, which was pretty interesting. It's not quite management, but you are sort of getting groups working together. So I said I had no management experience, but maybe that's not quite fair. Nobody reported to me. Um, and then I did the VP of engineering thing, which I learned a lot, but I found I did not like the lifestyle of hundreds of people all report to me, because it leads to a very, I, I have enough introversion in me that I like to have a kind of work where I can have a good reason to go spend three days focusing on something. Um, and so I went and, and did more vision work, uh, like where should the company be going and how uh, the company as a whole, how should that fit, especially in the dot-com crash? How do we come out of this thing? And, and obviously there's that opportunity again. And then, and then the idea of doing a book came up and I spent a lot of this last year, you know, in the upstairs room in my house, like, you know, all alone. And then I my co-writer, Pat, I'd argue with him, I mean, in a healthy way, but, um, that was fun, because I'm an engineer and I'm like writing this dry text stuff, and Pat is a novelist. I mean, his background is narrative fiction, and so he wants to get people in, and he writes the draft and it's all full of people, but I felt like it doesn't really capture the business issues, and I'd rewrite it, and he'd go, oh, Dave, you ruined it. It's got 
no, people is just like dry, you know, that's, is it the shorter type or the longer dry thing? And, and I'd be, well, of course there's no people. It's about market share and technology shifts. And he'd say, well, but how did you guys decide to come up with that strategy? And I said, well, actually, that's interesting because Dan thought this and Tom thought this, but I, and he's got, you guys were fighting? Let's put that in. And so it went back and forth. So we'd go write our own stuff, and then we'd come back, and he'd go like, I get your business point, but how can we get some people fighting to explain how it's going? And I'd go like, I get your story with the people, but there's not really a business lesson there. Can we? It, it was, so anyway, so that was a whole new kind of thing. So uh, the management thing for me worked out well for a couple reasons. One, it was yet another piece on my journey. And two, things that I've done since then, like in a more vision, strategy role for the company, I don't think I would be qualified to talk with the CIOs at our large customers and, and have relevant ideas for them if I personally had not managed hundreds of people in a $100 million budget. That I, They'd go, OK, what does he know? And so for me, that was a very good bit of experience to have had. But I'm glad I'm not still doing it. But I could imagine doing it again, maybe for a while at some point. But it's, it's not really an aspiration. Um, I, I have always been the most impressed with people whose careers bounced randomly, as opposed to the ones that just sort of progressed linear from, from one place to another. But, but again, th these, are, these are life choices. Uh, there's no hook, but I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting an understanding of the situation. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. <laughs> Thank you.